So I want to first thank Karina and, and Joachim for the invitation to, to, to come here and talk and, and also kind of to re revisit what I've done before. Uh, because, I mean, I've been slightly involved with HPV-related issues doing at least until a couple of years ago, but then primarily performed research within other areas. Um, and Joachim gave me this talk, register-based follow-up of a nationwide RCT on primary HPV uh, screening. And as I've understood, I mean, Ola touched upon this and maybe I've also touched a little bit upon it during the morning session. But uh, so I hope it's not too much of a repeat. But before going into sweet screen, I, I mean, I... I was in, I think, fifth or sixth semester of the of the, of med school, and then I heard this Professor Dillner give a talk, an inspiring talk about uh, um, infections and cancer. And I thought, okay, that sounds interesting, and and then I was thinking, okay, I want to go and visit my dad. He lives in Mozambique, so. Uh, Maybe I can go and do something there, a minor field study or so. And I, I hadn't really thought about HPV or so. I thought I could do something maybe on malaria or so. But I, I went up and I contacted you, you came and, and I came up and, and immediately said, no, but actually uh, there is this intriguing study, study published in, in The Lancet uh, by, uh, it was Xavier castel Sage's group. And they had uh, uh, done a population-based sample from the Manisa project outside uh, of uh, Maputo, um, around 250, 300 samples. And they had found that HPV 35 was the most common type. So that was really intriguing and you didn't really believe in that. So you thought, okay, that's good. No, maybe you can go and you can start collecting a, a, a case series of, of uh, we do a case series of cervical cancer. And uh, I said, okay, that sound, sounds interesting. So then I said, okay, can you pay my, my ticket? <laughs> and so you did, but I mean, it's been very fruitful. So you got, you got some payback, I think. <laughs> and so did I. Um, what was very nice, I thought, when I, when I was looking into this is, is, is also the, the, I mean, when I came there and then uh, the story was that uh, at the time, uh, Ilvar Selin was, was managing the, 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 the database of sweet screen and then he quit uh, and uh, I can't, there was basically a void, someone needed to take over and then I was asked. I didn't really realize how, how unique the study was and how unique uh, um, results we could get out of it. But I joined. But anyway, with regards to this, we, we, we found that 16 and 18 were the most common types. Um, I was also involved uh, during my PhD studies in a, in a serological study together with, with uh, Taiwanese collaborators. And I just want to put, I mean, there's the acknowledgement of here to you, Karina. I remember us doing lots of serology and, and thanks for being so patient. I, I, I have not been in a lab since. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and actually today I also uh, I, I did a PubMed search and I looked at Iek Lundilne. There's 51 co-publications. I don't know if it was mentioned in the morning, but I thought that was really impressive. 51. 51. And then of course there are lots of there are lots of acknowledgments also like this. Yeah. So um, from Swede Screen, I mean. There are many studies that have come out and I will touch upon them uh, during my talk. This was the one where we looked at the stereotype specific risk of, of uh, high grade sin. And uh, then of course the one that, that uh, uh, Ola talked about, which uh, where was actually the, the primary objective of the study. Um, there was the then joint venture with, with other European uh, studies. Uh, we did one uh, study on uh, which I get back to kind of the cost benefit of different screening strategies uh, then of course ag again pooling data looking at at um, uh, cervical cancer instead and at that point uh, Miriam Elvström had joined the group and 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 was kind of managing the the, the, the follow-up and uh, there you see again Miriam and then some other long-term uh, um, studies and that's where also Vitaly had joined the, the, the group at that point. 
And then I think this one uh, Christina was touching upon before. And these are not all. I mean, this is, this is, these are some of, some of the studies. So I thought I could go through a little bit of the main findings from the studies to, 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 to see what we've done. So as Ola presented and has been presented before, the study is, is of about 12,500 women that were randomized uh, one to one to either HPV testing uh, plus pap test or pap test only, and then there was a follow-up of the women that uh, had a positive HPV test and no record of referral due to an abnormal pap test. And they were offered a second uh, round of testing um, uh, at least 12 months later. And then the ones that were persistent, uh, with, uh, had a persistent HPV infection, were then referred to, to colposcopy. And then uh, I think there are some things that need to be said that, that, that of course I didn't realize at the time but, but later which I think really makes this study unique. I mean one is the, the focus on this, this age group and uh, if you're comparing it to some of the other uh, HPV screening studies that needed to recruit many many more women in their, in their trials, I mean this really improved the power of the study to be able to show uh, an effect. And then I think one of the other unique things is this thing about uh, that you thought about ascertainment bias uh, in the study. So you perform the same amount of cytologies and colposcopies in the control arm to control for just the, the ascertainment of finding disease. And that, was, that is something that's really, really unique with the study. And then of course all these women were followed by the linkage to the cytology and pathology registers. And the primary outcome and why it was designed was to, 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 to investigate the incidence of CIN2 plus found by screening that took place after the enrollment screening. And then of course many, many other uh, studies or, or <coughs> uh, has come out of, of, of the data. So the first one, when I got a uh, hand of this, the, this, then I had also, uh, um, I had met my now wife and she was living in London. So then I said, you know, can't I go for the last year to, to London instead and, uh, during my PhD studies? <laughs> and, uh, and you had uh, initiated a collaboration with uh, Jeff Garnett at Imperial College at that time. And uh, I remember meeting Matti there, for example. Uh, um, so so uh, the majority of these actually analysis um, were, were done while I was, while I was there. So, uh, until then, um, data on HPV type specific risk had primarily been based on cross-sectional case control studies. Um, there was at least a study coming out from the Schiffman group before where they had looked at the, the, the long-term risk in a cohort study, but the aim here was then to look at the prospect, uh, to prospectively investigate HPV type specific risk. And we used data from the intervention arm in this study. Uh, before Vitaly then did his 42 HPV, or the whole control arm, or <laughs> as was mentioned. But these are the main findings of this. So uh, that HPV 16, 31 and 33 were associated with the highest risk of CIN2+, and that 16 and 18 uh, attributed to 39% of uh, CIN2 lesions. And if you added 31 and 33, uh, um, the attributable proportion was 64%. And one of the things that methodologically that we were discussing a lot, I remember, was um, what should we use as the reference to, to uh, when we were looking at, uh, when we were calculating the uh, um, the relative risks. Uh, previously, a lot of studies had used HPV negative as the reference, but here in this study we used uh, as a reference um, being negative to that specific type that we were investigating, which, which basically uh, meant that we, we performed a multivariate model where we included all HPV types in the same model. And I think it makes sense when you're looking at attribute proportion because what you're actually doing is, you, the idea is that what happens if you're removing that specific type, of course the other types will remain still if you're looking in that, uh, uh, when you want to investigate that. So, so that was one of the, I think, interesting methodological uh, discussions that we had during this time. And I mean, I want to mention, I mean, before I, I went there, of course, I mean, it was, 
An important thing, I mean, is that that uh, I think I mean Joaquin inspired me in the beginning and to 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 continue with this. But I mean, uh, Karina did a great job of actually keeping us in the group and from day to day business always always positive and and making things work. Also for for people like me who came from a little bit outside, not with a with a kind of a laboratory background. And then the main study. Uh, the primary aim was to assess the impact of HPV-based uh, primary screening, as you have, have heard on the incidence of CIN2. And um, here, of course, one of the issues, if you run the co pure cohort studies, uh, it had been shown that you would detect more CIN2 lesions, but it could reflect the detection of regressive lesions, and that could then be investigated in, in, a, in, a, in a randomized trial. So the main findings is, uh, um, are presented here is that the women in their mid-30s who were screened for, for uh, HPV together with pap smears had uh, about a 40% risk reduction of CIN2 at the subsequent screening rounds. Uh, and um, the same was also true for, for CIN3. And I think here, and I will get back to that because that has been followed up by, by Miriam later, uh, looking more at the issue of, of uh, overdiagnosis. That we, th we thought that there was some evidence of overdiagnosis because you saw this increase of, of uh, uh, CIN2 grade lesions only uh, in the first, in the prevalent screening round, but you didn't see an equivalent reduction uh, during the the, the 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 consequent round, so 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 that would would indicate that there was some overdiagnosis. Um, then I had the opportunity to be part of of uh, when we we pooled data, and uh, it was pulled from from several uh, European countries, and the idea here was to get kind of generalizable. Uh, data on uh, the long-term predictive values of HPV tests on uh, CIN3+. And uh, this was uh, shown by uh, uh, Vitaly before, and I think it's an important study with regards to, to the length of, of screening intervals, where it, do, it does show that the incidence um, among uh, women that are cytologically negative uh, of CIN3 plus was 0.51 after three years, which, which uh, is the regular interval for, for screening. And it was actually 0.27 uh, at six years for the one with a, with a negative HPV test. And then uh, I had kind of... Uh, uh, basically finished my, my PhD studies at that point. And uh, I went on to do, uh, to, went, yeah, I was in London, I stayed in London actually. <laughs> and, and I started working as a junior uh, physician, but, but we continued to do some research. And, and this is one of the studies that came out of that. Um, so we, in, this, in this study, the idea was, could we use the, screen, uh, the sweet screen data to basically simulate different kind of, uh, screening strategies and, and combination of, of, of uh, HPV and cytology tests to see what is the most cost, benefit, uh, cost beneficial way of doing it. Um, <clears throat> and these are the, the, the major results, I think. I mean, you, uh, we compared it to cytology only. And actually, I haven't got it here, but I mean, a, a, um, HPV test and cytology of course, in this case, you would get the double amount of tests. So, so you would have to perform a, a, a lot of tests, uh, numbers tests needed for each, uh, with each screening strategy. But, but what we came to the conclusion was that HPV test followed by cytological triage and repeat HPV test if normal cytology, and there, of course, type-specific persistence was the one we looked at, would uh, have achieved high sensitivity and only a, a, a marginal reduction in the positive predictive uh, 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 um, value. And uh, the numbers of screen tests required to detect would only be increased by 12%. Uh, um, so, so that was how we, we, we um, kind of evaluated this data. And I think that has been uh, one piece of the puzzle to, to decide on, on, on current uh, screening strategies. 
Um, and then this study I was not uh, part of, but of course it's a, it's a pivotal study uh, where, where data was pooled from, from uh, Sweden, Netherlands, UK and Italy to assess the cervical cancer risk. It was included, I think it was included in Miriam's PhD thesis, or maybe she didn't include it actually in the end. It was at least mentioned there. And, uh, um, <clears throat> And uh, there was a comparison between HPV based com uh, compared to cytology based screening for, for prevention of, of uh, um, cervical cancer. And it's kind of one of the first real, real evidence that it, that it uh, really uh, prevents uh, cervical cancer. As you can see, uh, you have the experimental arm, which is the HPV arm, and then you have the uh, control arm in, in red. And you can see that the cumulative incidence is about to double if you look at an, at an eight-year uh, period of follow-up. And uh, in that corner, you can see the, the, the women that are screened negative uh, with each uh, test. So the pooled rate ratio was 0.6. And you can see women with a negative test of entry, the, the pooled rate ratio when, you, when you're comparing uh, um, HPV versus cytology was 0.3. So, uh, very important contribution there, of course. And then Miriam continued to, to, to use the, the register for, for her PhD thesis. And uh, the aim of this study was to assess whether the increased sensitivity of screening for human papilloma virus may actually represent overdiagnosis, which there was indication in the, in the publication from, the, from, from New England and uh, to compare the long-term duration of the protective effect against CN2 in HPV-based and cytology-based screening. So a little bit similar, similar as, the, as the previous paper where the data was pulled from different countries, but now with a follow-up time of up to 13 years. And as you can see down there in, in, in the corner, the, the uh, HPV-negative women have a very low risk of developing uh, CIN3 over a 13-year period. And there's very little added value of uh, a negative cytology together with the, the negative HPV test. And the other thing is that after six years, the cumulative incidence of CIN3 plus was similar in the trial arms. And after 11 years, the cumulative incidence of CIN2 plus uh, became similar in both arms. So there's some indication here that, that, that uh, actually the HPV test did, is earlier detection rather than uh, overdiagnosis of regressive lesions. Um, so finally, before I uh, finish, I, I mean, these are the ref some reflections that I that, uh, uh, put here. I mean, where the contribution, I think, with the register-based uh, 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 the, the linkage of the register to, to, to the sweet screen trial has, has contributed with. I mean, I think the HPV-specific risk of CN2 and CN3, uh, there are uh, several uh, cohort studies, but I mean, they are important for the design of HPV tests and the, and, and the vaccines, except uh, for looking into cervical cancer itself. And it showed the superiority of HPV-based primary screening compared to cytology for women aged in the mid-30s to prevent future high-grade lesions without leading to substantial overdiagnosis, at least. And uh, the, we could uh, do some analysis on the cost benefit of different HPV based uh, screening strategies. And also it contributed to the prolonged screening intervals that could be used with, with uh, HPV based screening. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the study showing the prevention of cervical cancer has been enormously important. And the first study coming out of Sweet Screen was in 2002. And the last one it was in 2017. I don't know if anything is ongoing now, but I'm sure you know there might be more coming. I don't know, maybe 20 years of follow-up. We'll see. Um, but I will finish there. I think. <laughs>